In the lonely heart of the South Pacific, the island of Rapa Nui, better known to the Western world as Easter Island, rises like a mystery from the waves. Its rolling green hills are dotted with hundreds of towering stone figures, the Moai, stoic guardians with long ears, solemn expressions, and hands pressed reverently to their bellies. For centuries, scholars and explorers have asked the same question. Where did these people come from, and what inspired such monumental ambition? 3,000 miles away, high in the Andes at 12,500 feet above sea level, the ruins of Tiwanaku lie scattered across the Altiplano. Built between 500 and 1000 AD by an enigmatic pre-Inca civilization, Tiwanaku is renowned for its colossal stone statues, precise megalithic architecture, and spiritual devotion to the sun and ancestors. Among its monoliths stands the so-called Bennett statue, a 24-foot-tall figure with elongated ears, a rigid commanding posture, and hands, like those of the Moai, placed deliberately across the abdomen in a gesture of sacred stillness. That detail, the hands, is not trivial. In fact, it may be the most mind-blowing evidence yet of a direct spiritual or cultural connection between the Andes and the Polynesian Pacific. Combined with recent genetic studies showing 8 to 10 percent Native American ancestry in Rapa Nui Islanders, the mystery deepens. Did Tiwanaku priests and stoneworkers cross the Pacific? Could they have seeded the monumental stone-building traditions of Easter Island? This is not fantasy. This is archaeology on the verge of rewriting itself. To understand the magnitude of this connection, we must first recognize what Tiwanaku was. Long before the Inca rose to power, Tiwanaku had established itself as the spiritual and ceremonial center of the southern Andes. Its builders constructed vast temples like the Akapana Pyramid, astronomical observatories like the Kalasasaya, and uncanny structures like Puma Punku, where 100-ton stone blocks fit together with the precision of laser-cut puzzle pieces. But perhaps most striking are the statues, the Ponce monolith, the Bennett monolith, and a host of smaller figures many found buried or ritually broken. These statues depict figures with flat faces, deep-set eyes, thin lips, and those same tell-tale hands, one over the belly, the other gripping a ceremonial object or aligned in a sacred pose. The statues were not merely art, they were ritual instruments, cosmic guardians, living stone representations of the divine and ancestral. Fast forward several centuries and thousands of miles west. On the volcanic plains of Easter Island, the Polynesians, navigators of astonishing skill, had settled one of the most isolated islands on Earth. There they began to carve. The Moai, sometimes reaching 33 feet tall and weighing 80 tons, were shaped from volcanic tuff, adorned with red, hat-like topknots, and placed on platforms oriented towards celestial events. And there again we find it. The elongated earlobes, the stone solemnity, and most chillingly, the hands pressed tightly to the torso, fingers extended across the belly in a sacred, intentional gesture. The people of Easter Island believed that the statues helped maintain soil fertility by paying tribute to their ancestors. This hand posture is not Polynesian in origin. There are no earlier Austronesian statues with this configuration. Yet in Tiwanaku art, it is everywhere. From the staff god iconography carved into the gateway of the sun to freestanding monoliths, the symbolism is consistent. The figure stands still and powerful, hands over the center of the body, often interpreted as the seat of energy, fertility, and transformation. It is a posture of sacred authority, and it survived not only the fall of Tiwanaku, but a journey of thousands of miles across the Pacific Ocean to reappear, seemingly unchanged, in the Moai of Rapa Nui. This is not random. This is transmission. And we now have evidence that such a transmission was biological as well as cultural. In 2020, a groundbreaking genetic study published in Nature examined the DNA of Rapa Nui Islanders and confirmed something astonishing. Between 8% and 16% of their genome is Native American in origin, introduced sometime between 1150 and 1230 AD, centuries before European contact. This wasn't the result of post-Columbian mixing. It happened when Polynesians and Native Americans met and had children. 
the most likely candidates for the Native American side of that equation? South American coastal peoples from northern Peru or Ecuador, just north of the Tiwanaku heartland. But what if it wasn't just coastal peoples? What if some of those who set sail were Tiwanaku elites, fleeing collapse or spreading their sacred traditions? By 1000 AD, Tiwanaku was in decline, battered by droughts, social upheaval, and the breakdown of its spiritual authority. In such a moment, priests and artisans may have set out to preserve their sacred legacy by sea. This idea isn't new. Thor Heyerdahl proposed that Easter Island had been influenced by South American cultures based on shared stone-carving traditions, the sweet potato's presence in Polynesia, a native South American plant, and oral traditions of long ears and short ears among the Rapa Nui. He built the Contiki, a balsa raft modelled on ancient Andean seafaring tech, and successfully sailed from Peru to Polynesia, proving that such voyages were possible with pre-Columbian technology. Because Europeans have to prove something to be possible before we believe Polynesians or Native Americans could do it, of course. Mainstream scholars dismissed much of Heyerdahl's theory due to lack of genetic evidence at the time and the overwhelming linguistic and cultural connections between Polynesians and Southeast Asia. But now, thanks to ancient DNA, we know he was partly right. Native Americans really did reach Polynesia before the Spanish. The real question is, who were they? Were they humble coastal fishers, traders, or were they bearers of ritual knowledge, monumental engineering, and spiritual symbolism? Were they Tiwanaku's last voyagers? Let us imagine a scenario. Tiwanaku collapses around 1000 AD. In the wake of environmental crisis and the breakdown of centralized power, a sect of stone workers, priests, and sun worshippers seeks to preserve their sacred canon. They head to the coast perhaps to Chimu or Moche ports, and adapt boats or rafts capable of long voyages, much like those of the Manteno people of Ecuador, who were known for long-distance balsa trade. Some sail west. Carried by the Humboldt current and trade winds, they drift or navigate toward the Pacific horizon. Eventually, they find land, a green island in the middle of nowhere. There they meet Polynesians, who've already settled Easter Island by 900 to 1000 AD. Whether through alliance, mutual respect, or intermarriage, the two cultures mix. The Tiwanaku priests share their knowledge of stone worship, their cosmology, their gestures, the hands over the belly, the long ears of wisdom, the reverence for the sun and the ancestors. Together they carve. The first Moai rise not just from the volcanic quarries of Rapa Nui, but from a memory born high in the Andes. Critics might say these similarities are coincidental that hands-on bellies could arise independently, but consider this. No other Polynesian culture developed anything like the Moai. Nowhere else in Oceania do we see this kind of statue-building tradition, much less one tied so deeply to stone platforms, ancestor worship, and astronomical alignment. And the Andes? They had it all. Stone engineering, ancestor veneration, solar cults, and those uncanny statues that seem to murmur across time and tide. Even the platforms of Easter Island have echoes of Tiwanaku-stepped pyramids, suggesting not only stylistic inspiration, but perhaps even architectural templates carried by master builders. It's a connection too precise, too sacred, too symbolically rich to dismiss. What this emerging picture tells us is that ancient people were far more connected than we believed, not just through trade or warfare, but through the migration of ideas, rituals, and genes— Tiwanaku did not simply vanish. Part of its soul may have sailed into the Pacific and found sanctuary on Rapa Nui, where it was reborn in volcanic tuff. And if that's true, if Tiwanaku stoneworkers and priests walked the cliffs of Easter Island, touched the quarries of Rano Raraku, and passed on the sacred gesture of the belly-bound hand, then we must admit something humbling. We've underestimated the ancient world. We thought they were isolated. They were not. We thought they were rooted in place. They were voyagers. We thought they left no trace. Their hands are still on the statues. Today, if you stand before a moai, let your eyes trace the fingers, long and graceful, reaching across stone hips toward the belly. Then look again at the Bennett monolith in Tiwanaku, standing silent in the high-altitude cold. You'll see the same gesture, the same devotion, the same coded message carved in basalt and tuff. And suddenly... The Pacific no longer looks like a barrier. It looks like a bridge 